Uh, my name is Paul Heidebrand from Heidebrand from the Kinder Credit Union Center for Peace Advancement. And um, um, again, glad to, glad to see you here. Also, as we begin, I want to acknowledge that we're gathering on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral Peoples, and we're grateful. The mission of the Center for Peace Advancement, or the CPA, is to advance innovative and expansive understandings and practices of peace. Um, and so we get excited when people come to us with ideas for bringing together peace building with other fields, other fields of study, other fields of practice. Scott Horton and me is a great example of this. Um, Scott is a candidate for a Master's of Sustainability Management in the Faculty of Environment here at Waterloo. He is also a graduate of the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Waterloo. And um, after that, went on to get a master's in social work from Wilfrid Laurier University. Apart from his academic studies, though, uh, Scott has a wide range of experiences that have equipped him to bring together people interested in environmental sustainability and people interested in peace. And I think today's presentation will give you a good sense of how he's equipped to do that. And I hope you come away with a sense of inspiration for the possibilities. Since moving back to the area in 2015, Scott's been part of Climate Action Waterloo Region. He's currently Vice Chair of the Workplaces or ICI Committee. Um, but he's done lots of other things. Um, he's worked for government and for a wide range of civil society organizations in both Ontario and in Newfoundland. And he's accumulated a dizzying list of volunteer commitments along the way. So in addition to being a fine student and researcher, Scott is a practitioner, an organizer, and a leader. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say, Scott, today. I want to start by saying this, uh, the impetus for this presentation came from a conversation that I had with Paul Heidebrecht, uh, who was just here. And I said to him, like, I've been to a bunch of different places over the last few months, and I traveled by plane to Amsterdam, I traveled by train to Ottawa, I traveled by bike over to uh, Boston School. And those were three different uh, events that I went to, uh, courses or three uh, events that I took part in. And uh, they showed me a few different things and I wanted to kind of put them into a presentation and share it with some people and get their thoughts on it. So that's what I'm doing here. The first one, the one that I flew to was uh, a master class on societal transitions uh, and it was hosted in Amsterdam, which is a very cool city and I'll show you a couple of pictures from there and some of the things that I did. And one of the things that it was kind of, that crystallized there for me was this sense Jan Rotmans, who's a transition scholar in Holland, who's been at this for a very long time, uh, he said that right now we're not we're not only in an era of change, but a change of eras. And I thought that was very a very profound thing. Uh, so that was that's kind of the, the the really big picture. And then when I was in Ottawa getting the national picture, I was at the Canadian Climate Change Forum. That was in October, uh, and the. Uh, the chair of the Canadian Climate Change Forum spoke to, uh, well, actually, Catherine McKenna, the, the Canadian Environment Minister, addressed us. And at the end of her talk, the, the chair of the Canadian Climate Forum got up and spoke to her, and he choked up because he was so, he was overwhelmed that the government was actually listening to them and that there was this productive dialogue happening because for many years it wasn't happening. So, that gave me a lot of hope, and it gave me a lot of hope for Canada and our place in this change of eras. Um, come on in. And then, uh, not long after that, in November, I was here in Waterloo. We helped, I helped to organize, along with Heather Douglas here in the Department of Philosophy, I helped to organize the Decarbonized Waterloo Region uh, Forum. And we brought together 50 experts from around the region, and we talked about how we could decarbonize Waterloo Region's energy systems. And it was a very fascinating uh, two days. And those 50 people worked extremely hard. It was I looked around the room, it was on Thursday and Friday, and on Friday afternoon, people were still working really hard. Uh, and I'll talk more about that later, but uh, it, 
So those three things are kind of at the global, the national, and the local level. And all of them, I found them very uh, promising. There was, there was nothing, there were no simple, easy solutions like here's how we're going to decarbonize, because it's extremely complex, as some of you were talking about complexity. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. But there was so much promise there that I wanted to, to share a bit of that with you and, and talk, share some of my ideas about how we can make this, move this forward. And I also definitely want to hear some of yours. So my first slide is, uh, this, this is what uh, Jan Altmans was talking about, was that we're in Cairo's time. It's a time that's ripe for change. Uh, you know, we've had some major pumps in the road along the way, but now is the time we can start building the, the low carbon economy. And uh, I picked this picture for the slide because it's, it's at, we're at a time where I think things could go either way. This picture says, does this picture say winter or does this picture say spring? So I'm kind of wondering to myself, are we headed for spring or are we headed for winter? And how do we you know, in, uh, some folks talk a lot these days about tipping points, and I'm thinking, how do we push it to the tipping point where we head towards spring instead of heading back towards winter? So, and and Jan Rothmans, who's been, like I say, he's been a, a sustainability scholar. He said he's got three decades. He's been looking at this at this idea of decarbonizing and, and sustainability for three decades, and he said, in from his perspective, it seems like we really are at a point where we could push things and they would tip towards the spring that uh, I think we really need to move towards. So in this presentation, I want to talk a little bit about, come on in if you like, uh, I really want to talk about how we get to those tipping points in Waterloo Region, in Canada, and, and in the larger world. And uh, my presentation title, Piece by Piece, you know, we're going to have to do this little bit by little bit, but there's ways that you can make things happen little bit by little bit that leads to a big change. And the second piece about PEACE, I also see a big role for peace activists, peace people, peace practitioners, all these people, and all of, most of you, if not all of you, said you're interested in this idea of peace. So where do people who have those skills and that interest fit into all this? That's one of the other things I want to talk about. So. That is my presentation. I want to talk about that and I also want to hear your ideas because I'm sure you have some. Uh, I think the best way to get people's minds going is to get their bodies moving. And so I've done this, this, this um, exercise a number of different times in different contexts. And uh, for this presentation, I'm calling it the game of the I guess I had not even that they're, it's not the right font. Anyway, um, <laughs> game of cones. Is uh, it's like the pacifist version of the George R. R. Martin uh, novel, and so it involves cones. That's you know that's how I had to make this work somehow. So I bought some cones, and I'm going to put them across the front of the room here. Actually, I put them right up the middle. And uh, I need as many volunteers. I need an even number of volunteers. It could be all of you if you like. So anybody that is interested can come up and stand in the middle here with me. And uh, I want you to stand, you can pick a partner, you can stand across from them with this, with the line of common in between. So, come on up everybody. So one person on this side, one person on this side. So we've got five, we need at least one more person. Oh, now we have a second. Oh, come on, come in. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Anybody else want to get in there? Oh, I forgot to mention, this might have been a more incentive, but uh, if you do this right, you can get dark chocolate or dark chocolate. Oh, Anybody else? Dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Gender balance. Gender balance. So here, is the, here are the simple instructions. Uh, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And in those 30 seconds, you have to get the person who's across from you to come to your side, but you can't touch them. That's the only rule. So uh, you have to get that person to come to your side. And you two are, are partners, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, everybody clear on the instructions? You have 30 seconds. Get the other person to come to your side. No touching. Got it? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just set my timer. And you'll have 30 seconds. Okay, you can start now. Just hold on. Just hold on. Oh, that was simple. <laughs> <laughs> 
but now we've got oh, wait, the switch. Oh, wait, I have to switch. I have to switch. Wow, these, these guys are pretty. I've never seen this happen that every person got this. Okay, <laughs> you guys are amazing. Okay, you can sit down. Rex Maya Exercise. How are we going to split these up? Oh, wait. How are we going to split these up? Yeah. Nah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pass them around. You can all have some, I guess. Maybe I'll keep them. Um, until we're you guys fading. are like a sure. What's that? Keep until we're fading and then pass them on the movie. Good idea. Good idea. So that's, that's incredible because I've done that exercise I don't know how many times. And I've never seen, I think, one, maybe once or twice that people got it. And you all got it. I saw all of you. The light go on immediately. So, this is a special group, I must say. So, um, but you wrecked my exercise, I must say. <laughs> because uh, most times when I do this, I'll have to use my worst case scenarios to demonstrate what I'm talking about here. But most times when I do this, people spend a lot of time, they try and get the other person to come over, they're doing a lot of arguing, they're saying, oh, look how amazing this side is. And they never think of just, there you go, switching to the other side. So, uh, you guys are already converted to this way of thinking. But a lot of people, and I'm, I'm, I can say this with confidence because I've done it with hundreds of people, a lot of people, uh, when they do this game, this game of cones, this is the first time I've called a game of cones, they, they think, uh, they immediately think, how do I get that other person to my side? And they engage in this kind of dichotomous thinking, there's my side, there's their side. How do I get them to my side? And so it illustrates some of these false dichotomies that we have. And so I'll talk about these briefly, because you guys already, you don't have these walls inside your minds. Or these <laughs> stuff. But we create these kind of us and them, and we see us and them. I mean, just look at the news, us and them, everywhere. Uh, economy and environment, and you could put in between these, you could put a versus. So I don't know how many times, I still see this debate happening about do we, what, are, what is our priority? Is the economy our priority or the environment our economy? And to me, that's like two doctors arguing over a dying patient and saying, well, they need uh, a heartbeat. Well, they need to be breathing. Well, if you don't have both, then you're dead. So same thing with environment and economy to me. It's a, it's a pointless back and forth sort of argument that we could get into. We could set these false dichotomies. Practical versus radical. Well, we have to be practical when we're uh, when we're working on decarbonizing the, the economy. But we also have to be radical because otherwise we're never going to get there in time. Uh, linear divergence. So this sort of linear thinking that maybe engineers are more famous for. It gets things done. You know, is that the kind of thinking we need? Or do we need divergent thinking that social scientists are more adept at or more comfortable with? Well, in the, actually, we need both in order to get where we're, good, where we're going. So that's uh, a little bit about these. Uh, those yes? Are you going to be making your presentation available? Um, or can we take pictures of some of your stuff? Oh, yeah, it's all totally, yeah. You can take pictures, I can send it to you, it's all, okay. yeah. None of it is like intellectual property or, I mean, you, know, you can have it. <laughs> um, so, uh, that, that kind of thing, this kind of, the us and them is, I think, foremost, in my mind, at least in a lot of our minds these days, around, uh, you know, issues around refugees and things of that nature. Uh, but these false dichotomies are, I think, one of the biggest barriers to moving ahead in terms of uh, creating a low-carbon economy. Uh, the next slide is, oh, this is, uh, so I'm, I'm going to give you another a different analogy that came to me when I was in Amsterdam, because they do a lot of money in there. Um, dichotomous bike riding. These guys are engaging in the first experiment of dichotomous bike riding. They're asking themselves, do we lean left or right? Do we need cyclical motion or linear? Which one of these is more important? Which is orthodox? Which is consistent with our values? Which one aligns with our identity? And you can see how their experiment is going. It's going terribly because dichotomy, this dichotomous thinking simply doesn't work when you're trying to get somewhere on a bicycle. So this is a metaphor for me of how we need to move forward with um, with the low carbon economy as well. So instead of this sort of dichotomous thinking, me, you, us, them, 
uh, cyclical motion or linear. Uh, I think we need to look more at balancing dynamic tensions. So environment and economy, how can they work together? Linear and divergent thinking, like I said, we have to do them together. Incremental or transformative, so that's so it's sort of like radical and practical. And how do we balance the local and the global aspects as well? And bike riding, uh, like I said, when I, when I was in uh, Amsterdam, I took a bike ride, I rented a bike and I went riding. And of course, I was like almost in tears because there was so much bike traffic there. And it was so well set up for bikes. But it also struck me like, this is how we need to be thinking. Uh, and managing these tensions rather than saying, you know, either or, which we get sent in. Um, one of the fascinating things about, about the physical properties of biking is that it's still, you know, you can, you can find videos on the internet of people. Science still hasn't figured out exactly how bike riding works. And that's one of the most fascinating things to me because, uh, you know, it's one of these things that we learn how to do kind of instinctively, but we don't exactly know how it works. And I, so that's hopeful to me in that I think we can learn, we can do the same, like if so many, so many people's minds, except yours apparently, are stuck in this sort of dichotomous thinking, uh, but there's this potential to move out of that way of thinking. And this little guy is my son way back, like quite a few years ago. But he's, he, the, the, the hopeful thing with bike riding to me, which is extend the analogy a bit, is that we can learn it. It's a very complicated thing that's happening inside your brain and your body. But even when you're little, like he's not even in kindergarten, and he's learned how to do it. Uh, you know, everything I learned, I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Well, he's not even there yet, and he's he got it. So that's hopeful to me. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and then so let's go forward to a few older guys like me. Here's our course in Amsterdam that I took part in. And we were learning in this course, in a more figurative sense, how to balance these dynamic tensions. This is the course that I took part in the master class. And there's a, there were people from all over the world. She's from England, she's from Italy, she's Canadian, and most of the rest of them are Dutch. That guy's Canadian. But we learned about how to balance these dynamic tensions. So it's something that I think we can learn even. It's not, it's not something that has to be bred into us, although it's great if it is, and apparently it is built, built into you, the way that you folks think. But it's something that we can learn as we, even after we've uh, been maybe contaminated or, or uh, rigidified into some other ways of thinking. Uh, a couple other pictures of, of my time. This is Jan Rotman's. It's not a great picture of him because it's taken on an iPhone, I think, but there I am still learning. He's the fellow that was, was talking about how this is a change of eras. Uh, I encourage you to read his stuff because it's very interesting. Uh, and we've also got one of the other things we did in Amsterdam that was very exciting to me was we went to this place called De Kirko. And if any of you are, are native Dutch speakers, I apologize for how I, how I uh, pronounce that. I never pick up the pronunciation exactly. Dutch is a hard language to learn, I thought. But uh, this place is very cool, and it's, it's an example of how you can balance dynamic tensions, I think. The, the plate, you can see these, these buildings here. This is actually a, a brownfield site, very highly contaminated. And this group of people got together, and they were some design students. There were a bunch of them that got together, and they said, we want to build something that can show a different way of running a city. And uh, the company's called Metabolic. And so they found these, they were, they were thinking, we're in Amsterdam, what do we do? Well, we'll, we'll do it on a waterway, because there's lots of waterways in Amsterdam. What else do we have in Amsterdam? What other resources do we have here? So there are so many houseboats in Amsterdam. So they took these old houseboats that were no longer being used. There's almost 20 of them there on the site. So each of these, each of these structures are houseboats. And they put them there, and they made this into a bit of a community. It's not a, if people don't live there, but it's all these different shops. And they've got a cafe there, and it is, it's the coolest place ever. It's so great to be there. But it's this, it, it, it was this garbage site before, just, so contaminated from shipbuilding that had gone on there for years, but shipbuilding kind of went belly up. So they took it and they, their, their vision is to, through experimentation, create uh, a new way of doing a city. And, and instead of, as we, we, set, we set up cities now that are 
uh, throughput. Like the, you get the raw materials, you use them up, and you spit them out, and God knows where they go. Uh, so they're trying to set this up in a more in a more cyclical way, and they've done a number of experiments, some of which have been very successful, some of which have been complete failures. But they recognize that that's part of this new way of thinking, and the tension that they're that some of the ten, they're, they're balancing multiple different tensions here, but. They're, they're not doing this as sort of off on their own, uh, you know, we're going to create our own little paradise here. Uh, they're working with the city of Amsterdam, and uh, you know, th that si that's a big city, it's got all the bureaucracy that any city would have, but they're interacting uh, daily with them to, to share some of the things that they're learning there. Uh, so they're kind of balancing this tension between the order and uh, the conservatism and the, and the stability of, uh, of a bureaucracy that would never experiment. And saying, well, we're going we're gonna to push from this side a little bit and say, hey, how can we do this differently? And it's, it's a very cool place. I was also, it was kind of bittersweet. I met a woman there uh, who's actually from Nadine, Missouri. And she's from Waterloo. She grew up here in Waterloo. And I think she went to University of Waterloo for a while, but she was so sick of how slow the pace of, of sustainability and decarbonization was moving in Canada that she, she's actually, uh, her parents are, are native Dutch, and so she moved over there. And I thought, we lost somebody, like, we need this person in Canada. So that was another motivating moment for me that said, we need to, we need to really pick up the pace here and, and change our ways of thinking in Canada. Um, are there any questions before I go on to the next little bit here? Any thoughts that you have? Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if you have any of the details of how they dealt with the, the challenges of a, of a brownfield site. So, yeah, uh, there's a few. Uh, we got a, a fairly extensive tour. One of the things that they did was um, they couldn't put any uh, pipes into the ground, so all of their water pipes are above ground, which wouldn't work in Canada. One of the things that Nadine said too is that, you know, we've taken everything, we figured everything out for Amsterdam, like with what we've got here. So uh, you couldn't just take to Google and say, well, let's do it in Edmonton or something, because you know your pipes would freeze for one thing. But I think it's the it's the way of thinking that they're you know taking that way of thinking and saying, hey, others can do this too. So the, the pipes above ground is one thing. Another one is, uh, I think, yeah, there's a few here. There's, they planted willows everywhere, and willows are apparently really good at absorbing uh, contamination from the ground. So they've planted those. It's going to take quite a few years, but uh, those are absorbing some of the contamination from the ground. So they cut the, um, so they can cut those down, and they, they just keep sucking, I guess, the contamination out of the ground using the willows. Those are two ways that I can think of. They're also doing a lot of uh, recycling of their water. Uh, so that they don't need to use as much of it. Uh, but there's a whole, actually, if you just look up, if you take down the spelling there and put it into Kerbal in a web search, it'll tell you there's all kinds of stuff on their website. And it's in English as well. So does that answer your question? OK, any other questions before we keep, oh, keep moving? Um, OK, the next piece that I want to talk about is uh, you know, this way of thinking, changing our way of thinking. and. Uh, so this, I'm in a church college, so I thought, heck, there's lots of good wisdom in the Bible. I go to a church, uh, this is going to be like a little bracketed part of the presentation where I'm going to do a little bit of a tiny mini sermon. But uh, the, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans 12, chapter 2. Uh, be not conformed to this world but, world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that is uh, a great verse. Uh, I like it a lot, and it uh, it says to me like that's that's how we have to change our minds is to renew our minds can, uh, constantly. Um, so this I think relates closely to. Uh, I just gotta check it out and see. I don't want to steal my own thunder. Yeah, so this is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about peace practitioners, because I said that I would. And I want to show you another little analogy that I had, that I was thinking of, uh, in terms of what peace practitioners can do. 
Um, so keep the people in mind in their work with uh, with people who might think differently from them. So if I, these are Rice Krispies, by the way, you might not be able to see them, but they're little tiny Rice Krispies. And here I have a chopstick. So if I try and pick up this chop, this uh, Rice Krispie with this chopstick, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it. Even if I put some concentration, or you know, I'm a man, I can use my power to pick these up. I just put some force behind it. Oh. It's not going to work. But what you got to do is this is chopsticks are a great example of managing managing dynamic tensions. And with two of them, if you have some dexterity and you're not nervous, you can pick one up. <laughs> so these are like um, this is managing dynamic tension. And uh, peace practitioners are like, in my mind, they're like the hand. That can that are the skillful hand that can bring together uh, people across different sectors who might you might think well how are engineers and social scientists going to work together but as peace practitioners you can find opportunities to bring them together so that they can be more useful you know one chopstick I don't know you could stab some things it doesn't always work but sometimes especially when it's really delicate work and really important work like this you need some dexterity so there's the uh, the peace practitioner is right there. And I want to do a little shout out now to one of the peace, one of the practitioner, peace practitioners from way back. We didn't get a lot of airtime. Um, but okay, so oh, go back to my verse for a second. Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the reality of your mind. So, anybody know who wrote this? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, so Paul, he's famous. He's got like St. Paul's College over there, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, like Paul this, Paul that is all over the place. Uh, do you know who actually made it possible for him to write it? Finally, I stumped you guys. <laughs> I thought you guys might, well, yeah, I guess that one, but uh, the, uh, there was a guy, and his name is Ananias. And he was one of the great peace practitioners, I think, because if you know the story of Paul at all, he was a really bad dude. And so this is, this is I'm relating this to this idea of uh, unlikely allies, of changing our minds, and of managing, uh, managing tensions. So Paul was a bad dude. He was struck blind. Uh, and I'm sure that when he was, Ananias was relieved because if you know anything about Ananias, he was working at uh, spreading this new way of thinking in the world with his friends. And Paul was uh, arresting them, torturing them, killing them, all these kinds of things. And when Ananias got his mission to go and see Paul, I'm almost certain that a wall went up in his mind and heart. And he thought, uh, this man is my enemy, and leaving one of them blind and helpless would be a lot safer for us, the people who are starting this new way of thinking, this new faith. Uh, but that's not actually ultimately how he reacted. He went to heal his enemy and restore his sight. And Paul would never, Paul would have been one chopstick if it wasn't for Ananias. And so that's where I can see peace practitioners really doing uh, some good work. So two millennia after Ananias, his radical practice of loving our enemies isn't just uh, a Sunday school lesson that we learn. It's actually uh, the work that we have to do in terms of collaborating across sectors like those folks at Decouple. It's problem solving using diverse kinds of thinking, wading into communities in conflict, and finding workable solutions. Uh, so that, that those are the keys, I think, to uh, developing a a low, a low carbon economy as fast as we can. So that's the end of my, and that's the end of us. So, oh, still in thunder again. So in addition to transforming our mind, I think we have to transform our governance and the way that we do things, the way that we run things. That's what that fancy term governance is really all about, the way that we run things. Uh, for a lot of decades we've been, and we, we tend to do this a lot, we tend to have like wars on drugs, wars on terrorism, so we attack problems. And we attack the problem of uh, energy and the problem of sustainability. And Dirk Rohrbach, who's another Dutch uh, academic, he called this 
the idea of the, the problem industrial complex. So what that is in a nutshell, you know, if you don't have enough energy, enough electricity to meet peak demands, then bam, we'll give you another uh, nuclear plant. And if there's too much traffic congestion, then bam, here's a bigger road. And I found this just random, but it says nobody's happy place. And whenever I'm on roads like this, I think the same thing. This is nobody's happy place. So if you need more renewable power, then bam, we will give you sweeping legislation. And everyone has got to love this. But as you know from the story of Kathleen Wynne, not everybody loved the, legis the sweeping legislation that they brought into. So this, this problem of industrial complex, uh, problem industrial complex approaches classic of command and control governance that we see all the time. And it's this kind of trickle down idea. Uh, we're often, how many times do, are, we, are we told in the media about uh, international leaders getting together and they're going to sign uh, an emissions treaty and it's going to be great. And uh, some of those environmental benefits will eventually trickle down to our community and to our children's future. So this is that kind of top-down governance. governance. And you can see, I, I love this quote. I stole it from somebody somewhere who stole it from somebody else. Government, if you think the problems we've carried are bad, just wait until you see our solutions. <laughs> so I have a hunch for that for a lot of you, this kind of government doesn't sit well at a gut level, but scholars and practitioners have been arguing for several years now that running the show this way doesn't, it doesn't even, it doesn't produce the kind of results that we need. So I'm not sliding on government in general because we need them, and it's way too easy a target. It's like shooting a barn. Um, <laughs> but I shouldn't even say shooting when I'm talking about government people. But you know, it's too e they're too easy a target. Let's go back and, say, and stick with that. Um, but we need to get a lot more creative about how we run things in 2017. So Harry Oakley, who's a brilliant British scholar who I have yet to met, meet yet, uh, says we need to flip that pyramid on its head, and we need to engage communities all over the world in action and experimentation, like the stuff we saw in Decoupal, and create this deluge of interconnected local action that has an impact at national and local levels. So instead of waiting for these fellows, and you can see Stephen Harper there behind uh, the Australian Prime Minister's hand, uh, instead of waiting for, for these folks to, to make all the solutions, they've got to be part of the solutions, but instead of us sitting back and saying, well, when are you going to do something about the environment? we got to get busy in our communities and kind of flip that funnel over. So this is another place where I think peace practitioners can be really uh, helpful and really make a difference. Uh, have you ever heard of something called restorative justice? There was a presentation here at uh, Connor Girl back in November about uh, restorative justice. And so this is an example of where peace practitioners, and actually it's, it's some of it started right here in Kitchener Waterloo in Waterloo region. Uh, they started with some experiments, some small experiments, and they went to the judge and they said, hey, can we do this restorative justice thing? The judge actually said yes. Now, a few decades later, only about a generation later, uh, countries like Northern Ireland and New Zealand have big parts of their justice systems that are based around restorative justice practices and principles. So that's an example of how peace practitioners have mobilized the community and have gotten them to say, you know, this system is not working. So how can we innovate? How can we make, with these experiments, show you a different way of doing it? So that's the kind of thing that I think the, the peace practitioners like us have to do. We have to mobilize and say, you know, if there's got to be, this system isn't working. Our energy systems aren't working. They're not doing the things that we need them to. They might be, the lights might be on, but what are the, what are the consequences of the energy that we're using when all those cars rolling past us? What are they burning? Um, so that's the kind of transformative work that we need to do. Now I want to talk a little bit about, unless, are there any questions or comments? Just want to give you space for that. Okay. Now I want to get into some of the some of the where this meets the ground locally. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was part of the decarbonized water the region forum. It was at the Balsali School, which is a beautiful campus, and you you know that over in Balsali land over there. Um, uh, so decarbonized Waterloo Region presents us with an emerging local opportunity. And as I said, these were 50 local experts who got together and, and amazing experience. Uh, and when we got together, we, um, 
I did some of the background work to, to figure out if we're going to decarbonize the, the region's energy systems, what does it look like right now in terms of uh, carbon? And these are some of the, these are the, the um, this is how we represented it. And there's a couple things I want to draw your attention to. I can send these to you if you like. But uh, you'll see this is the residential, this box is residential energy use. This is industrial, commercial, and institutional use. We couldn't break, the, we didn't have any statistics to break that down. But oh, another thing that I'll say, each one of these um, squares is a pedagogue of energy, which is equal to uh, 200, 278 gigawatt hours, uh, 948 billion BTUs, so I don't know how many BTUs you get out of your barbecue, but that's a lot of BTUs. Um, one thing we really struggled with here was how to even represent that much energy, but it's a lot. And another thing that stood out to me here was that heating and cooling our homes is a big chunk. And if you look at personal vehicles, that is a huge chunk of the carbon. Um, that's in terms of usage. In terms of the sources, we're not going to per what? Sorry? That is per year, per day, per hour? This is per year. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so this is per year. Um, and this is based on uh, data that's a couple years old now, but they've done the re-inventory, so we're going to do this again with the new inventory. It was unfortunate that the, the re-inventory was happening if they got it done just after we had this event. Um, but when you look at, this is the one that really uh, made us think a little bit was, and, and you know, one person said that they, they left feeling a bit more grief soaked. Uh, if you look at this one, natural gas is obviously carbonized energy, diesel carbonized energy, gasoline carbonized. We're doing okay. We've got some hydro. We've got nuclear is actually one of our saving graces in terms of that's some of the uh, that's the biggest chunk of decarbonized energy. We got this one uh, one piece here that's wind. But when you count these all up, this is uh, 64 petajoules per year that we're. Uh, that we generate to meet our, our needs over there. Seventy-seven percent of the energy comes from uh, fossil fuels in the region, which I was surprised actually how high that was. It's actually a bit lower than the world average, but it's still like seventy-seven percent is a big chunk of our energy. So uh, we brought these people together and we said to them, "What do we do about this?" And we thought, "Let's." Let's come up with scenarios for de decarbonizing. We spent those two days. We didn't come up with any eight scenarios that said, hey, here's how we get transportation from uh, highly extremely highly carbonized like it is over to the decarbonized side. So that was frustrating, and that was, that was really an eye-opener. But one of the things we did do, I think the most important thing we did do, was figure out what are some of the biggest challenges we have to overcome. So it gave us, instead of just saying, wow, 77%, wow, 64 petajoules, what the heck do we do with that? Where do we start? We came up with these ideas for uh, where, where are the biggest challenges that we have to take on and kind of make it into, into little chunks that we can start with. Well, big chunks, but at least something. Um, so these are the four challenges, and I want to talk about these when we have our discussion in a minute. So the four challenges, uh, number one is reducing energy needs by 50% in the built environment. That's one of the things we have to do in order to decarbonize. We, that's, that the, you know, the experts in the room had some consensus around that, and we have to reduce our energy needs in a big way. Uh, maximizing local renewable power, and some of you know a thing or two about that. Uh, one thing I was surprised about in this in this uh, forum was that we didn't have as much renewable power potential as I thought we might, but maybe there's something going out there that none of us thought of. Uh, eliminating fossil fuel transportation, and that is a huge one. But we've all, you know, if you think even five or ten years ago, EVs were just something, you know, like the crazy guy down the street had his EV, but now they're actually picking up. So. That's uh, promising to me in terms of that even a decade can change things quite significantly because now EVs are, are making pretty big inroads. Uh, the fourth one is replacing natural gas for heating because it's, you know, when, we, when I'm at home in my bed at night, I'm being warmed by natural gas for, and I'm not saying that we have to, you know, go home and feel guilty about burning natural gas because I like being warm, and so do you, I'm, I'm guessing. But we need to figure out a way to, to do that. We still need to be warm in our homes, but how do we do it differently so that we're not, you know, that the only way we can do that is to burn natural gas. 
Um, I'll just say one of the things about natural gas is it's a. This was one of the biggest challenges that we identified is how the heck do we get off natural gas? Um, one of the things about natural gas, it's it's touted as this clean fuel, and it is cleaner to burn than coal. But if you add up all of the fugitive emissions that come out of the infrastructure that gets it to you, uh, you know there are studies out there that say that it's dirtier than coal. So it's not, and I'm not saying that to vilify one fuel or another. I'm just saying that we can't sit back and say, well, natural gas is a clean burning fuel. It is, but it's also the those emissions that it, that it lets off through the leakages in the in the infrastructure are actually worse for global warming than uh, carbon dioxide. They're about 16 times worse than that. So uh, it's still we still got to work on this natural gas thing. Is what I'm saying. Uh, these were plus one, uh, one and the plus one being U University of Waterloo's one petajoule challenge. So I'll go back to this. Uh, so you see the personal vehicles and interstate commercial, and we saved one petajoule for University of Waterloo because University of Waterloo uh, uses. It's actually, I think, 1.3 petajoules. It's got its own petajoule. So of the entire region, over 1 64th of the region's energy is used here on campus at University of Waterloo. So that's, that's big. And so we thought, you know, we got to do something about our, because a lot of us at the forum, that, well, a big chunk of us at the forum were from University of Waterloo, not from University of Waterloo. So we thought, we got to do something about this one petajoule. Um, so, any questions about this diagram? Because I'm throwing a lot at you. I'm just curious about current energy use in terms of food. So, knowing a little bit about debates about climate change and where we can most reduce our carbon emissions, meat often comes up as a significant yes. aspect of it, but I don't even see food on this list. No, and that was that's an excellent question, and uh, we weren't avoiding food, but we we. We put it outside the scope of what we were trying to do because if we had added food in, we would have just drove ourselves insane. It's we, it, it has to get like we weren't saying we don't care about food or, the, or you know embedded emissions. Like there's a whole other part of this picture. This is energy, so we we picked that as our focus, and it was a plenty big focus. But that's an excellent point. I totally agree that food is and meat eating is uh, a huge issue that we've got to look at. Um, yeah, especially around the methane part of that. So I'm, I'm glad you raised that because we couldn't look at the whole the whole carbon picture for the region. It was just to be added to another piece. Uh, so yeah, any other questions? Okay. Uh, so next steps. I want to talk a little bit about next steps, and then I think we are pretty close to the end. I want to hear from you folks. So next steps. Um, we're doing some. We had this forum in November. Uh, part of my thesis work, my research work now, is to organize focus groups. I had my first one this morning, and the the main um, the thing that we're talking about in those focus groups is how do we crack those big challenges that we identified the four big ones there. And uh, I need to figure out what we're going to do about the UW challenge. I'm hoping you folks have some ideas. Uh, so uh, we're doing the follow-up focus groups to see what, what we do about these challenges. We're connecting all the stuff that we come up with in these focus groups. And we're figuring out how do we connect it with the stuff that's already happening in the region. The region has a climate action plan. Uh, we want to connect with all the things that are happening there. Now, I'm, and I'm one of the, Mike and I are both on the committee that's looking at uh, the ICI, the Industrial Commercial Institutional side of all those emissions that we were talking about there. So we're, how can we move forward in a way that fits well with what the Climate Action Model Region is already doing? There's three committees. There's the ICI that I already mentioned. There's also the residential, which looks at, of course, uh, you know, where we live and how we can reduce emissions there. There's also the um, transportation, which is looking at that big, big personal vehicle use piece. Uh, so there's those three, and those are all uh, just regular citizens. There's people from government on there, there's people from the universities, there's, but it's just, uh, it's people like you and me who are sitting on those committees who are looking at ways that we can reduce our, um, our emissions in the region. Uh, the other piece there is that we're also working with the region, which is doing a, a community energy investment strategy, which is very interesting and very exciting, and looking at how we can 
create, uh, how we can be more creative in our energy production in the region. Uh, okay, what else? Start experimenting. So the Kirville that I talked about where they've got all those houseboats and that cool stuff going on, how can we start doing stuff like that in Waterloo Region? Because we know how to do innovation. I mean, this is the most innovative university in, the, in Canada for the last like 23 years or something. So we've got the innovative brains. We invented the Blackberry. You know, we were the first to do blue box recycling. Restorative justice started here. There's plenty of innovation, spirit, and practicality here. So how do we harness some of that? Um, and engaging the other 574,942 citizens who are not at the decarbonized forum. One of the things near the end of the forum, one of the things we talked about was, you know, we we in this room, and maybe a lot of us in this room are thinking we need to do this, but a lot of those other folks lots of other folks might not even be thinking that. They might not realize that it's an issue. They might realize that it's an issue and not care. They might just say, you know, get away from me with your, I'm going to drive my car and I, you know, it's my life. Just end of conversation. So how do we even engage with those people is another thing we need to think about. And the last piece there is your ideas. So I want to get into that in one second. I just want to show you one other, actually, I want to get into that now. I'll show you the quote again. Um, so what are, your, what are your thoughts on, and I want to especially get some of your thoughts or um, ideas on the piece around uh, the University of Waterloo's one editorial challenge. Don't, don't constrain yourselves, I'll get, to that. I'll get to that, but I'd love to hear some of that. Any thoughts on what we do next? to decarbonize one of the region. He's got it, right? Yeah. Oh, well, since I've arrived here, I've been finding just for University of Waterloo, it's heated really quite warmly. I've been living in t-shirts all winter. My sweatshirts just stayed in my closet. And so I think a quick thing which could be done to significantly drop natural gas effect, especially would be to simply turn down thermostats. People have, most students appear to have adequate cold weather gear and they're not using it indoors. Yeah. So you don't. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, I wonder if there is if there are things that simple because the University of Waterloo has built a lot of buildings in the last few years, and that's a lot more. Uh, you know, if you look at the I don't know if any of you looked at this, but the sustainability report for you are for the University of Waterloo. You're not in there, like maybe you had a look, but uh, UW's emissions are going the wrong way, <laughs> and part of it is those buildings that are more buildings that are heated. Nice and toasty one. How do they really need to be? Uh, that's an excellent point, and I'm going to riff off that and say I was sitting in a meeting. We were talking about uh, climate change in a meeting, and I had worn, I was dressed for the weather. It was the middle of the summer. I had a cotton shirt on and shorts, and most of the other people in the room were in full business attire on a really hot day, and I was freezing uh, because the, the air conditioning was on bust. And I thought, this, is, this makes no sense whatsoever. Like, why don't we just dress for the weather, like you said, instead of, uh, you know, having this tiny little range that we're comfortable in. And it's probably colder than it would have been at this time of year. So, that's a good point. Any other thoughts here? Yeah, one of the first things uh, we find uh, yeah, the U.S. experience but is getting a baseline, getting people information. We're doing something called long, uh, monitoring based commission along, uh, which is in a sense behavioral change from long term journey. And so we're doing this on many tens of thousands of businesses in Illinois, and we're starting to look at some stuff in Indiana, we're doing this other states as well. And so, uh, small, medium businesses, but we find when people start to see the information we track, get a baseline, people begin to see what they can do once they've got the knowledge and information. And, you know, we can say uh, we're in our little company, we're saving people, we're saving huge amounts of energy and, of course, cost savings as well. So, there's dramatic changes, in, and there's a lot of studies on long term based commissioning yeah. done by Stanford and other places that show that on a sustainable way, you can cause people to change the way they're doing things to optimize to carbon reduction. 
And this is a very, I'm an engineer by the way, and, so, and sometimes I'm an engineer, engineer with that border, so yeah. uh, I just don't always think literally, which is a challenge for some people. And so um, there are ways to do this, but it's, you're moving into the behavioral space. And we're, we're, we're just here to do this. There's quite a, few, a number of people that are coming here, graduates from Cradle. Excellent. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really working. We're starting to see, you know, major, major opportunities uh, for, for really reducing the, uh, the use of energy. That's excellent. So, that can be used to, I don't know what's going on in the region. And we're starting to talk to some people here. But, um, uh, but there may be people doing this here. I don't know. But I think that's, if it's not been done, that's something that can be done. Yeah, there are pockets, but it's, it's definitely at our focus group this morning. I was, there were people there who know what's going on in there. And they were saying there's some happening, but it's not. It could be, there, there could be a lot more going on. Well, we do the Denver airport. You know, reduce their energy usage, brought close to the problem city. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do. Wow. And if, so these are the planes. Uh, it's a very low cost initiative solving the company. Yeah. But we find that when people start to monitor it, they start to see, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, they start to change their way. Now, in Europe, like for example, we have a system in Sweden, and they display in, in Volvo in Sweden in their head office, and there's a big display showing the energy usage. Yeah. And people are really interested in how they can reduce their energy. Yeah. And so we ran that software for them so we can actually put displays around the place so people can see the how they how and they can really get connected. And then they start to change a couple of ideas about how to do this. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Well and that's the like you're talking about, I think part of it is just well, it's nice and warm in here. Like you're not thinking about why? Well, why is it nice and warm? Well, because we're burning like a petajoule of energy every year. So the, the information is really key. Oh, to you. And uh, I was going to say, oh, um, we heard about at the ICI committee last year, we heard about um, Brick Brewery, which is a local brewery, uh, of course. And they, uh, they undertook some major uh, retrofits of their, of their water loop plant. And they're now. Uh, well, I think they were voted the greenest brewery in the world, in, like internationally, and that wasn't even what they were going for. They were looking for cost savings, and they they, they realized and they had major cost savings. But along the way, they actually wound up being this the greenest brewery internationally. So you know, it's it's not insignificant. And if you're a small business, you know, would you rather have that money just? Flying out the roof, or would you rather have it in your pocket, and you know, in your employees' pockets, and you know, having you available for you to grow your business? And another a question over here, and then you, yes. Well, in terms of uh, experimental ideas, reading reviews of the book um, "Join the Club" yesterday, which was uh, it's a book about how basically groups that are formed to help change behavioral norms and how that how successful that is. Yeah. And uh, I know people, I don't have a car since moving to KW in 2009, but I know people who have described me personally the journey of giving up their car and sort of the social pressure they face to yeah. keep their car. And so starting like a support group for people who are giving up their cars as an idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that a lot of this, like I was talking with the, with Ben and Blank, Robot says with the, the problem industrial complex, we think well, if we're if we're uh, you know exceeding our peak load capacities, we got to build another nuclear plant. Well, maybe we just need to change some people's behavior, or give them information so they can change their behavior. Yeah, it's really key. Um, the book is called Join the Club. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Something Rosenberg. It is at KPL, and I haven't gotten it out yet. So okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, and you have, yeah. Uh, so, how much difference can uh, solar panels on personal homes make? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in, in our climate? Yeah. Um, well, ours, we have a 10 kilowatt hour system. I don't actually know a lot of the ins and outs of it, but would you, how, would you feel comfortable yes. sharing some of it? Um, a 10 kilowatt system would produce more energy than your, the more electricity than you're using in your house for most houses. Yeah, because we're the fit, the microfit program is pretty much finished. Um, the rates have cut to the point where 
within three or four years you'll be getting more if you get metered. But when you get metered, you only want to produce as much energy as you're using. And typically houses need about five or six kilowatt system. Yeah. Our house is, uh, we're lucky because our house is uh, facing off on two seven and it's got a big roof and there are, there's not any shade over that part of the roof so we could pull off a 10 kilowatt system. But like you say, that, that was my understanding too was that our house is producing more power than it's more electricity that it's using. That doesn't touch the natural gas that we're burning, right? Well, like, they're finally coming up with um, standards for solar ready houses. Like, Believe it or not, they gotta tell the architects to face the house itself. <laughs> That's one of the things in the standard for you. So, or at least good east west, but because they lay out the subdivisions, they don't like they don't they don't care about what direction the houses are facing or keeping keeping surfaces for the uh, yeah. panel, clear surfaces for panels. Yeah, right. Yeah, that kind of stuff really it makes me kind of crazy. But it goes back to this whole idea of like transforming our minds, like just simple things like that that are making a huge difference. Like, you know, where are you going to put the house that, or the 50 houses you're going to put in this subdivision? Um, did somebody ask us about something over here? I have a, a, a comment to uh, reinforce both the, your, your thought about information sharing and uh, your, your idea on uh, reduction of, of um, what we know as comfort, comfort levels in our in our uh, environments. So just recently there was an initiative that was put forward that uh, uh, we were going to have sweater day, sweater day in the, in, with the city of Kitchener. And um, my initial thought was, well, why don't we have a sweater season? You know, start <laughs> November to April, and, uh, and, and just you know, let's get real about the whole thing. And uh, and so. Uh, anyway, information went out and, and Sweater Day uh, um, took hold and um, I, I, before Sweater Day happened, I told the building operators that had control over some of the facilities, I said, look, I, I want to see the, the set point temperatures dropped by three degrees. And, um, well, that happened and, and my inbox blew right up and, uh, you know, so I was getting a lot of uh, nasty, uh, well not nasty, but inquiring uh, um, emails about, well, oh, why is it so uncomfortable here? And sort of inquiries. Um, I'm sorry? A sort of inquiries. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 I, and it was a real opportunity for me, um, number one, to see uh, where we need to improve in terms of the communications that we send out and, and to, to make sure that people are aware of um, um, the, these kinds of initiatives that are going to happen. Right now, pretty much is an all department's email that goes out and it's um, deleted. Uh, by, by probably 75% of the people that receive it. And so um, it was an opportunity for me to see that, well, number one, there needs to be improvements there, and then I could then send that same email back to the people that were inquiring with me that, well, did you read this? Because there it is. And yeah, it was interesting because it was a little story with that, right? So there's that piece, and, and yeah, that, that's great. And, and, and to, um, I think that what needs to happen, I know what needs to happen, is that we need to change the expect expectations that we have are around these kinds of things. So is the environment uh, warm enough? Well, yeah, it is when it's cooler. Is the environment cool enough when it's warmer in the summertime? Well, yeah, it is, uh, dressing appropriately. And so that expectation, uh, the people's expectation needs to change. And, and then to add some complexity around municipal governance is that uh, we have a, a lot, we have a big tax paying group that have levels of expectation when they come to our facilities or when they visit our parks or, or whatever. I mean, in the face of a drought, the parks are green and uh, the, the soccer fields are green. I appreciate the fact that there's a standard that needs to happen when it comes to soccer fields, but <laughs> what, are, what are the expectations, right? So those things have to be um, definitely um, considered. And then, of course, when it comes to information sharing, uh, that's critical, critically important because, well, the impact that people have when they're operating their own homes is they see the bottom line. I am making a difference because I have less to pay. It frees up some some uh, some resource for, for other things that they may take on. So that's where they get hit. Well, people get hit directly in the, in the pocketbook, one way or another, uh, good or bad. But when they're uh, using facilities and they're um, 
uh, they're, they're working their day to day uh, through their day to day activities, and it just seems like an inconvenience. It just seems like an inconvenience. They are, um, I guess, dramatically uh, phrased. They're suffering, um, and uh, so when information is shared with them, and they can actually see that they're making that difference. It, it goes a long way, and it shows that yeah, there's some enthusiasm that can be built around that, and, and uh, so yeah, that's that's a great great information to, or information is a great tool, and it's something that we are working aggressively at being able to produce on a regular basis so that people can see that they're making a difference. Right? Yeah. yeah, and one question that I have around uh, solar is: uh, Have you heard anything uh, on the horizon with regards to legislative change pertaining to virtual metering? They are not going to do virtual metering. They're looking at it. So the new regulations for net metering came out uh, in February. And they intentionally left virtual net metering off of the uh, list of things they're going to allow. So it's one meter, one. And that really curtails net metering at a commercial level, mm -hmm. which is what we're looking at. Because if you have to find the person who's occupying the building has to own the building. Otherwise, there's really no good way to net meter, to pay for it, because the tenant won't see the benefit. But, so a tenant won't, isn't going to put something that's got a 20 year payback on the roof, or the net meter is around 10 to 12 now. So um, if you've got a multi unit part of the building or whatever, you can't put. Um, it's very difficult to put solar on that apartment building and share it amongst all the uh, users. But that's net metering now. With virtual metering, the way I understand it to be is that um, I then could uh, put, well, even. Well, that's the next level. That's even further away. Oh, that's they, cool. didn't even go with yeah, the, they didn't even go with the um, single owner virtual net metering, yeah. which is, would be the simplest. In other words, the, the first step of virtual net metering will be a large company. Maybe they've got a one roof that's a really good roof, but it's a warehouse. And then there are manufacturing facilities, like, for instance, um, well, somebody like the color, it's a manufacturing facility is full of chimneys, and you can't put anything on the roof, but they might have a storage warehouse somewhere that's fairly clean roof. Uh -huh. The idea would be you put a huge solar on that one, but that building doesn't use it all, then you can share it amongst all your businesses. Uh -huh. That's that, that's the nearest one to come. But the one where you and I could actually buy somebody's power from their net metering system, mm -hmm. that's a long, long way away. Well, so to expand and jump in, if I'm completely whacked with what I think here, is that um, when it comes to uh, um, the idea of virtual metering, uh, I would love to be able to um, um, rent land, roof, parking lot, whatever, to third party. They would own the solar. Um, what I'm looking for is carbon credits out of that. And uh, so if I have four facilities that are on a particular um, grid location, if that solar um, array can power um, one, two, or three of those, uh, those facilities, that would be ideal for me, right? Um, so if that ever comes to fruition, that would be a pretty easy way to uh, decarbonize. Yeah. Yeah, I need to get my head around virtual meetings a little more. I'm not that familiar with it, but it sounds happy. Um, the, I was going to mention as well the uh, the city of, or the town, I guess, of Overtoks in Alberta. Some of the stuff that they've been speaking with speaking is eventually we've got a, a neighborhood uh, breaks landing. And that's definitely where the look, they've, uh, they've done some, uh, they've, they absorb solar, the, this neighborhood is basically designed so the houses are, are absorbing solar energy, solar thermal. Uh, during the, obviously the warm months, they're absorbing more of it, and then they're storing it. They've built, in the middle of the neighborhood, they've got a park that underneath it is a massive storage tank. And I'm not sure exactly how the storage works, but they store this thermal energy over the course of the year, and then they draw on it. And because the whole neighborhood is connected to it, you're drawing on this massive store of thermal, of thermal energy rather than thinking about, you know, every house has to have its own uh, energy system. You're, you're thinking, so this is again a change in the thinking that has to happen. With, and at, um, actually, at the, at the, at the decarbonized form in November, we were talking about this switch from me energy to we energy and how that can actually, and it's not just like a, you know, a, all you need is love kind of thing. It's more like a, this actually makes more sense economically and not to mention the environmental issues. 
Well, the story of Commons that moved um, housing development uh, just north of Midtown, uh, not too far from the Google building, uh, is all uh, thermal. Oh, yes. Energy. So, and, and there are like, I think, four condominium buildings, like from four to 12 stories, and then a number of townhouses. And I think they all share the same um, so it's geothermal. Geothermal, thank you. So, uh, geothermal. Same, same geothermal system. Okay, geothermal district energy. I'll have to check that out. I wasn't aware of that. Thanks. But yeah, there's, there are so many, and you know, this is one of the last things I'll say and then pass it around to you for the last uh, last thoughts, but, um, you know, you look at, uh, we sometimes say, well, how would we ever make this work because we've already got all this infrastructure here. But then you look at LRT and we ripped up, and not only LRT, but my street, uh, this summer, this past summer, they dug up my street four times in the course of three months or so. And that was to, I mean, it was aging infrastructure. So, and that's going to happen on every street, you know, coming up from the core. We live fairly close to the core. It's going to keep expanding it. So if we're spending that kind of cash, why would we not put in some geothermal or some uh, some uh, ground source heat pumps when we're doing that kind of, you know, that, that costs a lot of money. And that's a lot of, a lot of personnel is there. So those are some of the other ideas I'd love to see us pursue. Any other final thoughts? More questions? Okay, I'll leave you this uh, this quote. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, we should be able to see things as hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. So this was really useful to me in the, after decarbonizing. You know, you've got all those pedicules, all that, all those fossil fuels being burned. It looks definitely hopeless, uh, or at least pretty close to that, but we have to be determined to make it otherwise. So that's the quote that I want to leave you with as you, uh, as you go on your way. Thank you very much for, uh, for being part of this.